advertisement for a new movie. This is a warning. If you are squeamish, if you have nightmares, if you have a weak heart, before you experience Reanimator, think very carefully. Reanimator began um, for me when I went to meet Stuart Gordon. I think it was 1983, and he was introduced to me by, or the meeting was set up by a friend of mine in Los Angeles named Bob Greenberg. And I was looking for a director. I wanted to make a movie in Hollywood. I moved to Hollywood. I wanted to do a movie. I had borrowed all this money, and, and I was trying to work there in L.A., but, you know, I was sort of the out-of-towner that was being taken advantage of. And, and so I decided, well, I'll just make, I, I need to make a movie, and um, I need a director. And Bob Greenberg said, oh, you should go to Chicago and meet this theater director. He, I, I know you guys would get along. So I went to Chicago and I saw Stewart's um, plays and we were both big horror fans and he already had this idea to make a TV show based on the Lovecraft stories of Reanimator. And I told him, well, I'm not interested in doing TV, but if you want to do a movie, let's develop a movie script and then we'll see how that goes. And so we immediately started doing it. I think exactly a year after meeting Stewart, we began shooting Reanimator. Um, and that was um, luckily had this uh, had a success. It turned out really well, and um, from there, um, both of us were able to um, kind of make a career in the in independent movies. This is morbid doodling with human body parts. Is this what it's all about? Something so shocking. It must be true. There is my creation. Originally, when we were when we were making um, when we were finishing Reanimator, of course we all. You, it's funny with the movies. You always talk about a sequel while you're making the movie. How oh, what's what happens next? You know, and um, and but I think that. Originally, we didn't think about making a sequel to Reanimator. We thought the sequel would be Dagon, would be Shadow Over Innsmouth. It's not a sequel sequel, but, but it's a, we saw it as kind of a sequel. Yeah, then we make Innsmouth. Um, and I did have the script to Dagon written by Dennis Paoli back in 1985. And we did our second, there wasn't really the second movie, but Functionally, the second one was From Beyond, a, a Lovecraft movie. We didn't immediately think, oh, let's do a sequel to Reanimator. We thought, let's do another movie like Reanimator. Um, when we were shooting From Beyond and Dolls, we shot them back to back in Rome, Italy in 85, 86. Um, I remember we would talk about a Reanimator sequel. And at that time, the title Bride of Reanimator um, came up. And that idea actually had the elements of what later we tried to set up not so long ago, House of Reanimator, which was Reanimator in the White House. So the idea, the original idea of Bride of Reanimator was that we would see what happened that Dan Kane ended up with, with Meg and Wes disappeared and Dan is kidnapped and finds himself at the White House and West is working for the White House, and then we had this whole thing about reanimating the president and, and all these um, celebrities being reanimated that the CIA had in the basement, like John F. Kennedy and people like that. Um, this was when Reagan was president, so there was always this kind of idea that he was dead anyway, <laughs> that Reagan always was falling asleep, and he was a bit... Um, you know, so we, we thought it would be appropriate that he actually is dead and has been reanimated. So that was the original, that was just never written down, but just talked about. The talking, um, eventually we went through a lot of other projects, never a sequel to Reanimator. And when I think when I first spoke with Stuart, when we were working on Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, I spoke to him about doing a Reanimator sequel. And I had been listening to this band called Oingo Boingo, Dead Man's Party, 
and it really inspired me. I wanted to use their music for a sequel to Reanimator. Um, and I remember mentioning to Stuart once we were heading to, to the studio, and, and at that time he had decided that he wasn't going to do sequels or his agent. Had, he didn't think it would be good for his career at that point. That looked like with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids would really <coughs> take off into the big time. And, um, and then we, then after that, we tried to set up Shadow over Innsmouth and this voodoo movie, and these things didn't work out. And, and eventually, we, Stuart was still working with Charlie Band, Charlie Band of Empire. Um, I had given him the right to sell Reanimator, then he didn't pay me the money, typical Hollywood thing. Then I had to sue him. And we made Dolls and From Beyond with his financing. But see, Reanimator, I completely financed, and I was just stupid enough to let him sell it. So I ultimately never really made, people think I must have gotten rich on Reanimator. Well, it wasn't me. <laughs> it was, you know, Charlie and these other people. And that was a typical, that's pretty typical when you go into a new business, I think. You don't know um, how to handle it. Um, but the, um, the, at that time, we did Dolls and From Beyond, and then we were working on RoboJocks, and, at, and that's when um, I quit working with Charlie because I started suing him. And so I didn't think that I could be working on a movie with him while I also was um, take, taking out a lawsuit against him on behalf of another picture. So I quit, and then I was going to try to do Dagon because I had found financing in the UK to shoot it in Wales. But then Stuart decided he wanted to stay with Charlie and make RoboJocks, and I couldn't work with Charlie. So at that point, we started our, our work paths really diverged and never really came back together again. We crossed on a couple of movies. <laughs> And eventually, I, I um, decided then that I would try directing. And so I came up with a package of two movies, because I thought, well, maybe if the first one's no good, I left Bride of Reanimator as the second one, because I knew that was the plum. And I found a friend of mine who used to sell movies for Charlie Band, Keith Wally. Uh, a Brit that was, he was a football player actually in Britain and had come to the LA to play football, uh, soccer, and then he got into the movies with his buddies. And he started a company with another Brit who lived in Japan and had financing through a Japanese company. And so they, so then I found this script Society, which um, I thought was very paranoid but it needed fantastic elements, so I worked with the writers to develop it more into something I liked. And, and then I was lucky enough to, to meet Screaming Mad George and get his collaboration on it. Um, so that was the way I got into directing. It was mainly by dangling Bride of Reanimator and then getting my first shot with society thinking, well, if it's a failure, they've got to stick. I still got to get another chance, <laughs> you know. For Bill Whitney. I've never been paranoid. Fear plays a large part in family life. I feel like something's going to happen. And if I scratch the surface, there'll be something terrible underneath. Stewart was still involved with developing the original script for Wild Street Pictures, the company um, Keith Wally and, um, had created in, and Paul White had created in LA. Um, but I started first with the original writers, who were Dennis Paoli, William Norris, and Stuart Gordon. And we had a certain story about, um, I think at that time, West and Kane were actually working at a, in a mortuary. And, and uh, Meg comes back. And, but then it seems like we weren't going to be able to get the script in time. And we had a really short window for shooting it. The financing was there. And so at that time, I just, I just started over and got the writer from Society, the two writers, and we sat down and 
banged out a script, I think, I think it was like in six weeks, and just moved forward. And so it, I just diverged completely because I knew that, um, that you know, Stuart had told me it would take them like six months to do the script, and I, I just, I'd lose the financing. And so I just moved into it that way. And that's, uh, so that's how I got into directing. By when I shot Society with Keith Wally um, and Paul White, you know, that um, worked out okay and was especially successful in some places in Europe. And so that, so they were real happy, it, you know, to do another one. And, um, and so we did Bride on kind of in a big rush. Herbert West is not just your ordinary doctor. Others dare not dream what we are about to do. He intends to make medical history. This is no longer about just reanimating the dead. I, I always liked the name Bride of Reanimator because it was more like the universal horrors. I looked at the stories and tried to pull together all the elements from the short stories that I thought we hadn't quite used. And so there's a lot of things that, that are pulled into it. And then I tried to keep it in, keep it continuing from the other one. And, you know, I was really concerned about it all being part of the same story. I tried to keep the same tone, but of course I'm not, I was not near the storyteller Stuart is, or was at that time. And I think that the storytelling isn't as good as the first one. Plus it's of course not surprising because people have seen it. But, you know, you can see that in Bride, there's more, you know, I really like effects. So the first image I ever had for Bride of Reanimator for the sequel was the finger eye creature. And I had always had that one. That was always in my mind. And I just love this idea that of making things out of flesh. And so that was, I was focused on that. Well, that's the kind of thing that, that's something I like, you know, and you can see in society that kind of element too. And that's not, you know, Stuart is much more ori oriented towards kind of theatrical storytelling. Most of his movies you could tell almost on a stage, but I don't think any of mine you could. <laughs> and I think that's the difference between, you know, it's, different, it's different types of storytelling and I think that someone who can tell a story on stage is, um, that's kind of a more pure storytelling. Whereas I get sidetracked by all these concepts, mythologies, you know, even with society, you know, I was really concerned about this whole mythology. I always think of the movie as like the part of the iceberg you see, but I'm always, I'm so concerned with all this mythology, how it makes sense, where, it, you know, what, how it works. And that's something that um, somebody, you know, like with the original reanimator, Stuart really, he's concerned about how the characters play off of one another and you know that's real theater and me I'm kind of like well let's see how did that ha how does this happen how, you know I was always concerned on the original reanimator I remember some of our conversations um, would be you know I was really big on the head you know in the original script for the TV show there was there didn't it just went to Halsey's death and when I th thought to do a movie I thought well I like the guy carrying his head around because I remember with the House on Haunted Hill with Vincent Price when he finds a head. I always like the movies where the head is living. So I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff. And, and I thought, well, I really want to have, you got to have the guy with the carrying his head around. You know, that's a movie. So that's where my, you know, that's what I focus on. And then it's how do you cut the head off? What can you use, you know? And then it's, well, how can a head talk? He doesn't have any lungs. And then we, st we even talked about it. Maybe we put lungs in it. We keep the lungs. And God, that's terrible. You can't keep the lungs. But then how does it talk? You know, in monster movies, the heads can talk. That's just the way it is. <laughs> and then it's, but, but how does it um, nourish itself? Well, then it should be in a pail of blood. And that's why you have all that scene with the blood. And it was all coming from these sort of ridiculous obsessions with trying to find some logic in the illogical. And really in, a, um, in horror, 
uh, the kind of horror I like, there's already it's kind of a genre that has certain um, certain accepted conventions, and I always think that horror is always kind of a representative. It's kind of a uh, ex. Uh, it's a. I like the um, the expressionistic elements of horror. I like the idea that what you see is trying to present how you should feel, not what's there. Forget it, Dan. She's just an assembly of dead tissue. H.P. Lovecraft's Bride of Reanimator. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> You're not scared, are you? Scared? Why should I be scared? I want to work with you. When I got to Spain to do the Fantastic Factory, my intention then was to realize something I'd been trying to do in LA for years, which was to make a label. And I got close a few times. <clears throat> Finally, when these Spaniards wanted to do it, I just jumped. And one way to get the buyers to pre-buy the movies was to put a reanimator sequel. So we put it in and didn't, um, I didn't even have a script then. You know, I had some ideas, I'd worked on ideas, but the idea I was working on with Beyond Reanimator was a, was the once again I started getting into the mythology because with Bride I thought we always have to keep the work advancing I wasn't so I didn't know how to just tell another story within the rules of before so for me it was like well then this time it's about creating new life so that would be by putting pieces together so they build a woman. And then for um, Beyond, that was done now. And now we really left the stories behind. And I, um, so I started thinking, well, now the idea is how do you solve the problem that zombies always act funny? They, why, why would they? If somebody who, who dies on the operating table and is brought back doesn't run around chewing people up. So why is it that when Wes brings somebody back, he's, they're not acting properly? He always thinks it's because they're not fresh enough. And, um, so then he tries killing them and bringing them back. The, um, then I thought about the mythology of zombies, and I'd already done Return of the Living Dead 3, where I really kind of also tried to come up with some mytholo mythic kind of concept behind the zombification and I decided that um, <clears throat> the reason what makes somebody a zombie or a living dead what makes that abhorrent is because they're soulless and I always think that horror normally deals with psychological and religious elements um, and you know sci-fi deal can very quickly goes into political stuff so I, I have a, I, I think that that's pretty typical of a horror movie that you're going to have these, these sort of life and death, sex and death type questions. Um, the, a zombie in Haiti is someone without a soul, somebody whose soul has been taken and they're controlled. And so I think that's why the living dead are abhorrent. So that way, so then I tried to figure out, well, why is it that we're, that the, um, that West, West should be thinking about this and this movie should solve this problem. So then, of course, I had to put him in prison for a couple reasons. Because, one, it had been so many years since the second one, and, Je and Jeffrey Combs is aging, that I had to keep the years clean. And so then I, I had to say, yes, it did take, it is that long. So then I had to think, well, what happened during those 13 years? And if you take the, Jeff, the Herbert West of the first two movies and give him 13 years to work, wow, where are we now? 
you know, what has happened? It's, it's hard to <clears throat> jump so far ahead. So I had to slow him down. I had to slow down his research. So I thought, well, then if you're in prison, you can't, your research really gets slowed down because you don't have all the lab. And that was one reason to put him in prison. You know, a lot of the earlier versions of Beyond Reanimator, and I had some very developed ones that are completely different from what I shot, they always, they almost always began with West in prison. And that, and Dan's the guy who sent him up by making a deal. And I thought that's completely logical because somebody has to pay for what happened in Bride of Reanimator. In Reanimator, you can assume they just think something went crazy. But in the second one, my God, they, had, they were digging bodies, they were going into crypts. The cops are going to come and something's going to happen. So what's going to happen? Well, somebody's going to have to be taken to court. And so it made sense to me that Dan, being the weaker of the two, would turn state's evidence and testify against West because West ruined his life. If West hadn't come along, he would have married Meg and his father-in-law would have been the dean and he would have had a great life. But West came and, and like Mephistopheles, kind of drew him into this, this world and his father-in-law's dead, his, his lover's dead, he's in a world of horror. His whole life is ruined because of Wes, so it makes sense that he could go, well, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> and so I always thought he, in, he got it in return for the notes, you know. And then Wes is in prison, so they would have this conflict. So that was always the beginning. My last partner turned state's evidence against me. I'm expecting better things of you. Watch out for her. She's trouble. When we finally did it, I didn't, um, I decided not to shoot the courtroom part. And, when, and then there was always a scene with West in prison. And then finally, I started thinking, you know, um, I think it's maybe better to just tell a prison story. In the original versions, Dan had to get West out of prison and make a deal with him so that he could help a politician that you was the prosecutor who, who made the deal with him and she's now up for election and she's, there's a very embarrassing killing that's gonna ruin her personal life. And so she brings Dan in, he's gotta help her forensically find out who's blackmailing her, who, who's the, the serial killer, is this really bad guy. And to do it, he's gonna try to bring back the body to tell who did it. But he's been running out, he's become a famous surgeon, transplant surgeon, because he's had a little, he's been using diluted reanimating fluid in with this heart transplant. He has a magnificent um, record of success, but he's a completely corrupt person. He's a drunk because he was, because he, you know, he turned against his buddy and he's just this completely unethical person who's very successful but is um, miserable, and he can't make any more of the serum. The notes just don't quite work. So then he needs to get West out to redo the serum so that they can bring back the, the victim, and the victim can take them to the killer. So that was the original idea. And, um, but then it started seeming like, well, you know, maybe the prison's the good part, and maybe don't bring Dan back because that they just, you just end up with these two middle-aged doctors. You know, it starts being like Robin and Marion. You know, you hate to see Robin Hood when he's an old guy. So you need to kind of skew it more towards the ages of the original movies. So I thought, well, you need a new Dan Kane. There's not really room to have two people like him in the movie. You need a new girl. And so then I just eventually thought, well, I'll just do the whole thing in a prison. It becomes a prison movie. And of course, a prison movie is always about one thing, getting out or not, you know. So that became the whole genesis of the, of the Beyond Reanimator um, movie, that story.
It was really challenging on Beyond Reanimator because Jeff, we did it in Spain. We shot it at a, in, a, in a prison in Valencia. The whole crew was Spanish. You can hardly get effects in Spain, even though, of course, that, you know, that one company that won the Academy Award was there, and they worked on Dagon. But you know they are real expensive in Spain. They think the you know the effect. There's not many people doing it. They're not at the cutting edge. It's very very difficult, and so there. And then you're dealing with people who don't really understand Reanimator. Many who have never seen it anyway. Here it's not like there's a lot of support, and so it was kind of really interesting because it was Jeff and me. And we were the ones that were holding the flame. You know, we knew the flame of what Reanimator was, and nobody else did. So we're, I think we were both very, very nervous. I, I'm sure Jeffrey was really, really nervous, you know. And I certainly was. It was, wow, because you hate to let down the franchise and the fans. And for me, it's not like, it's like with Return of the Living Dead 3, that was a sequel to a really great movie, Return of the Living Dead, which is one of the three and a half really key movies of the early 80s for me that defined a kind of genre. It was Evil Dead, Reanimator, Return of the Living Dead by Dan O'Bannon, and I would say the I would have to throw in Nightmare on Elm Street, although I kind of make it a half one because it's a bit more mainstream in a certain way, but I think the tone of Nightmare on Elm Street in the first half of that movie was really crazed and wild in the way that um, Evil Dead and Reanimator and Return of the Living Dead were. So I think those movies you can put together and say are kind of the genesis of a whole kind of subgenre. People call it tongue-in-cheek, but it's not really tongue-in-cheek. It's not, you know, when it's wisecracking, you know, when there's sayings that, you know, when the hero, the villain, says something funny when he kills or something. I know, yeah, Freddie did that a bit, but you can call it tongue-in-cheek, but especially with, I would you know, Reanimator and Evil Dead, it's funny, it's really comedic, but it's pure horror. I mean, it's horror for horror. When you see the first Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy is scary, you know? The killings are really, you know, I call them fun. But, I mean, they're real rides. Uh, Evil Dead is hugely entertaining and really scary in parts and real horror and really makes you laugh. Uh, you know, Return of the Living Dead is the first movie that ever really represented EC Comics and Mad Magazine in the movies. You know, they tried to do EC Comics with Creep Show, and all through the 70s, every now and again, somebody would try to do comics. Only Dan O'Bannon did it. After he showed how to do it, oh yeah, they could do Tales from the Crypt, but they were basically copying, re copying Return of the Living Dead. So these are big, important movies in my book. When I got the opportunity to do Return of the Living Dead 3, I didn't want to separate from it, you know, and I really also wanted to be, to fit in with um, Dawn of the Dead or Night of the Living Dead. So I was real worried about the mythology once again and had a whole scheme for it, but, but I didn't make it funny like Return of the Living Dead. I didn't feel the need to, to carry on what the way Ken Wiederhorn felt got that need to even used the same actors in Return of the Living Dead 2. They really tried to keep the same kind of energy and flow of the first movie. When I did three, I basically was basically doing Bride of Reanimator, except having the bride be the whole character. And I didn't make it, um, it wasn't overtly funny. I find it hilarious, some of the movie, but it doesn't have the same tone. Because it, but with Reanimator, I feel differently. It's like I can't veer. If I had made Return of the Living Dead, I probably would have made Return of the Living Dead 3 just like th that one. I would have carried it on directly. And I think that this is 
it depends on what you're close to. And so with Re Reanimator, I feel very, it's difficult for me to, to break too much from, from the past. And with Beyond Reanimator, I just felt like, you know, we were just, we were out there in Spain and you, you, there's, you know, with Spanish actors and just Jeff and me and trying to hope that developing this script, just trying to reach for the tone of Reanimator to carry through the characters. And, you know, I don't know, you know, in Spain, some of the critics said it still maintained that um, what in Spanish they call la caspa espanol, which means that when they have a movie that has kind of can't get rid of that Spanish feel, they call it a dandruff. And so I think maybe all the, all the um, Fantastic Factory movies have a little of that. Maybe Dagon less, you know. But certainly, a lot of certainly, I would have to say that Beyond Reanimator would have been a bit different with shot in the States, the same story. But I, but to make it and to try to fit the the style, you know, the other movies was um, was a nervous challenge. Thirteen years. There's bound to be some deterioration. The um, Beyond Reanimator did mostly, I think it was the vast majority of the territories put it out on DVD. In Spain, of course, we did theatrical releases for all the Fantastic Factory. Some places they, they did theatrical releases. But I would say to most of the major territories, it went to video. And that's mostly, I mean, that's a sign of the times. When it came out, you know, if it had come out in the late 80s, of course it would have gone theatrical. But everything's been changing over the last 10, 15 years. And um, what, you know, in the 80s, theaters were open. They weren't monopolized the way they are now. And um, also movies were being financed independently off of pre-sales. And none of that's going on anymore. And it all, over the 80s, it changed. Everything became more monopolistic. And then there's the rise of then video, you know, DVD kind of saved the video market for a while. And people started making movies direct for video. Uh, that's where the financing was. It costs more money to release a movie, to promote a movie theatrically then they paid for the movie itself, then the budget of the movie. So if you make, you know, back in when you, could, you would make a movie for, you know, uh, you know, a million and a half or two million and put it in a movie theater, well, today it costs five million just to advertise it in the movie. Well, that's, uh, that's a problem. Now, the, and, they, and you're up against the huge movies. You're up against big movies, and somebody goes to the Cineplex, should they see, um, you know, a hundred million dollar movie or that two million dollar movie? There was a time when it didn't matter because movies weren't released so wide, they weren't so promoted, it was more word of mouth, there was lots of independent cinemas. It's a different world then, it's not now. And then the internet's changed everything because people download and there's lots of competition for what to do with your time to play video games, to go on go to Facebook or YouTube, or you can do so much. And um, so the, the economics has changed, and the way mo the, re the movies are made based on the economic environment that they're in. And there was, uh, it was different in the 80s than it was, than it is now. And I think this is, um, you know, it gives the, the um, it, it determines the kinds of movies that, that we will see. So no, the, Beyond Reanimator at that time in the early eight, the early 2000s was very difficult for a low budget movie that wasn't a Sundance, that wasn't like what they call an indie film, to have a theatrical release. And so they mostly went to cable um, and video. In, like I said, in Spain, of course, it got a big theatrical. In a lot of Asian countries, it gets theatrical, but certainly Germany, France, UK, it's very difficult that you see a small budget movie um, 
getting a theatrical re uh, release. Yep, you know, Reanimator never was a box office success. Not even the first one. It didn't, in the U.S., it did very, I think it took in a million dollars at the box office. Of course, I had, you know, I let um, Empire release it, and they, they were just beginning theatrical, and they didn't really do much with it. But none of the movies did big theatrical business like some of the other franchises, like Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, these movies did huge numbers. Saw, you know, Scream, you know, sat, sat Friday the 13th. The, um, so they don't have a theatrical um, history. So to do a sequel to Reanimator, you're going to looking for financing, and what companies look at is, okay, they just want to see the numbers. So when they see the numbers, they see that it doesn't support a theat. You know, you don't a, a a sequel that didn't go theatrically. It's very difficult then to do another one that goes theatrical. Normally, it's half lives <laughs> down, and so that that um, hurts the financing. And if I bring Stewart and Jeffrey and um, Bruce Abbott together into Reanimator, which there's costs for the rights, and if I'm coming in, well, everybody wants some money. It's not like the first one, where everybody's basically working for nothing. It's, hey, this is a successful thing. I want to be paid. Now, if I go to Stuart or Jeffrey and I say, let's do this. Here, I've got this movie to do. Well, they'll be quite flexible about their compensation because they want to work and, you know, we look at it like any project. But if I come and I say, well, you do Reanimator, they want the payday. They help make that as they should. Well, that means that already the budget is way higher than any other movie like that. It's easier for me to do Dagon, in which if Jeffrey was in Dagon, he would do it cheaper, or Stuart work. Everybody will do it at, based on the budget of the movie because it's, you know, we like making movies, so we, work, we do what we can. Of course, we'd like, if their budget's bigger, we'll all take more money. But if there's not much budget, then you don't. And, but if it's Reanimator, that's different. So when I did Beyond Reanimator, you've got to think, I was locked in by the Spanish system there. We were working with subsidies. In all the Fantastic Factory, I was the only foreigner, you know. I was the only guy that wasn't Spanish in that whole project. And so it was difficult when you bring people in. And to do Beyond Reanimator, there's no way that I could afford I had to base it on Jeffrey. He was the key. When I looked at everything, I thought, well, the essential element is Jeffrey. Reanimator books, if people read the stories, that's not the Herbert West in the stories, that kind of ironic, crazed guy that Jeffrey um, played based on the character written in the script, not in the stories. So when you, can, when you look at the Reanimator movies, that's really not Lovecraft's character. That's a character that was, um, according to Stewart, the writer who was most responsible for the West character was William Norris. And so he gave him that edge, that kind of funny, crazy, horrible edge. And then Jeffrey Combs was, took it and ran with it, and Stewart let him. <laughs> not only let him, but helped him. Um, so I think that, that that's the West we know. Now, any reanimator that I was involved in that was coming out of these movies, that's sort of maybe what we know the best about the movie, is that edge. But you can see that even people who have nothing to do with the movie, like this comic book of, of, um, of reanimator versus um, Evil Dead, they use the West character, but they pretend that they're basing it on the public domain reanimator stories. Of course, that's all nonsense because they, that character doesn't exist. But that's, I think, what people know about reanimator, and that's what we um, expect to see.
You wanted me? Uh, yes, yes. Here. New work assignment. <laughs> It's not so easy to finance, even though to the fans they think, yeah, they're making, you know, the all, remaking every minor horror movie from the 80s. Why don't they do it with Reanimator? Or they made seven Howlings. Why don't they make it with Reanimator? Well, the, I think the simple answer is, is that the, most every other franchise is owned by a company. But Reanimator is my, is, is my thing. And just like Phantasm is Don Coscarelli. So you see those two franchises are kind of similar. He's made a few more, but you can see that they're kind of similar in the sense that they kind of stuck close to the beginning, the origins, and they never just became taken by a company and, and, um, and reinvented the way Halloween or Texas Chainsaw or some of these other movies have been. And I think that has to do with the um, the, you know, if Don was willing to sell Phantasm, the, the, the label to Universal or to Lionsgate, maybe they would take it and then make a ton of Phantasm movies. But he doesn't want to do it. And I think the same thing goes for Reanimator. I always want to make more Reanimator movies, but I never could, I don't want them to be like some of the serialized movies become. It's, it's too dear to my heart, you know. So that's how you know, that's why it's so difficult to, to get another one out. Back in the um, 90s, before, you know, Jason versus Freddy and all these things, I had gone to Don Coscarelli and proposed to him that we join in and make a, a Phantasm versus Reanimator, be the first cross-horror franchise uh, movie. And, you know, I could just imagine the, um, the poster of Herbert West and the ball, you know, and the dark man. I mean, it would have been great, you know. I would have loved to see that movie. But I understand, you know, Don didn't want to do it, um, you know. And I said, you, you know, I told Don to direct it and let's just join in. But I understand because he, that's his franchise. Phantasm is his. He wrote and directed all of them. And I just think it's really difficult for him to think about letting it, get compromised in any way, even that way. And I think, they, so I, I understand it. I think I have the same problem with Reanimator doing sequels. I'm not, I'm not willing to give it up to sell it, to sell the right to somebody to make a sequel because I, I'm afraid they won't do it good enough or they won't do it, I, I don't know, some weird way that I think it should be done. It's kind of foolish because I could certainly use the money, but I just don't um, see it, you know. The, um, the, you know, at least the ones I did, there was never anybody saying what I could do or not, you know. So however it took to get them made, even the Spanish and the Fantastic Factory, you know, I developed all those ten movies in the Fantastic Factory. I came up with the idea for it. I, it was my, I wanted to do a, a label like Hammer, and this was my chance. And I really wanted to make this, um, work, you know, and to do Reanimator, Beyond Reanimator, it meant, you know, I never, there was, I was limited by the way it's financed, it has to be done using, you know, it's all Spanish, it's, um, you know, we had our limitations, but on the other hand, nobody was like editing the project or, you know, I just had to deal with production. And it was, I pretty much did what I thought I could, you know, and what I could come up with. The, um, you know, I think, I mean, you can tell that, uh, you know, I think the equivalent of the high, and high eye creature and, and beyond is the little fight at the end and the end credits, which for me, it's kind of like, I just think it's delightful, you know, to see that little shadow of the penis and the rat fighting. And I go, you know, I love doing scenes where I just know that there's some filmmaker somewhere going, how the hell did they let him do that? <laughs> and I think, wow, just to get a chance, you say, yeah, I'm going I'm to bring the penis to life and have it fi fight a rat. 
on screen in a movie that people will see and you think, wow, that's kind of fun, you know? And that's, uh, you know, that's, of course, it's a bit wild for Reanimator. You know, it's different from the first one, but I, for me, it all kind of follows the, the same. I think they all kind of fit together. And I think mainly the fans um, were okay. I, I think the, the reaction that we got from Beyond Reanimator was good, was generally good. And I think it was a huge relief for Jeffrey. I know it was a relief for myself. Uh, there was so nervous that it wouldn't be good enough, you know, and the fact that the, that the reanimator fans pretty much said it was okay. Wow, that was, that was good, you know, because you hate to, you hate to disappoint the fans. Now, I'm sure, you know, a lot of people would have liked it to have been a lot better, but at least it wasn't uh, a real um, disaster.